Thank you for joining us. We hope that you're encouraged by today's message. Visit us every week for new sermons at the EWC. You can also visit us live on Sunday mornings at 1030 or Wednesdays for the Reconnect at 7. We're located at 6801 Weber Road in Corpus Christi, Texas. Also, if this ministry is a big blessing to you, you can help us by supporting us financially by giving online at theexchangewc.org. the scripture, the theme scripture for this series. We've read it every single Sunday. It's found in the book of Romans. This is the way it goes. It says in Romans 12, 1 through 2, this is the message version. And so the scriptures are right above me. All the translations I'll be using today, it's a lot easier just to look above me and uh, take notes if you'd like to. It says, so here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, you're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work and walking around life and Place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what He wants from you and quickly respond to it. And unlike the culture around you that's always bringing and dragging you down to its level of immaturity... God brings the best out of you. Have you known that to be true? Have you found that to be true? God brings the best out of you. There's something about when you're going through things in life and you choose to finally just give in and come to church or finally just give in and go to God, something happens with inside of you. Would you admit to that? God brings the best out of you. He develops well-formed maturity within you. Today we are closing out our series for the month of January, and over the past few weeks, we have been, number one, reintroducing ourselves, not to each other, but to ourselves, because we've forgotten who we are, amen? We've forgotten who we are, so we've reintroduced ourselves. We've been reimagining ourselves. See, in the beginning, God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, they're all hanging out one day, and they said, let's make man in our image. Let's make man in our own image. That doesn't mean that you have God's eyes and God's nose and the cheekbone of the Holy Spirit or anything like that. It just means let's make him them in our image. And through life and through the things of life and everyday life and the, just the grind of everything throughout the years, we forget about the image. And so God says, let's reimagine ourselves. Let's remember how God created us to be. Amen? And then last Sunday, we re-reminded ourselves. Re-reminded. We looked at the story of Jacob and Esau and how Jacob uh, got the blessing that was intended for him. It was. God said, the, the older will serve the younger. It was always the plan. But his mom decided to help God out. Anybody ever been there? You want to help God out? You, you want to make sure that you get what you're supposed to get? And, and, but, it, you know, it's, let's trust God. Let, when you walk in His ways, you walk in His will. Amen? When, when you're in the middle, and when you're walking in His ways, you're smack dab in the middle of God's will. And He will bring you to where He wants you to be. He is not going to lead you in. What kind of God would lead you in the wrong direction? God is always going to lead you where you need to be. You just need to be right in line with what He has for you. So we re-reminded ourselves that what God has for us, He wants us to have. Uh, who He's created us to be is He's not going to jilt us. He's not going to give it to somebody else. We, we need to be in the pathway that God has for us. And so today we're going to reignite ourselves. Amen? And you might be thinking, well, I don't know about this I introduce myself and ignite myself and all, and all this. It sounds like a little bit of self-help there, Pastor Corey. I don't agree with self-help. I'm not talking self-help because all these things involve God in your life. It's only through God. It's only through His power. It's only through His glory and mercies and that, that this is going to happen in your life. It's through Him because like that scripture said, it's not until you get into His presence that's when you start feeling how God wants you to feel and be who you are. And it's just, oh, there's just a total change in you only when you're in His presence. It's not about self-help because you can see how it went in your own life when you tried to do it yourself. How did that work out? It's all about God. 
And so when I say reignite ourselves, I want you to think about King David. When King David was having some issues and some problems back in the Old Testament, he needed to reignite himself. His city had just been overrun. The women and children were taken prisoners, and his army wanted to stone him. Would you say he was having a bad day? Can you imagine your family? Oh, no, yeah, let's kill him. Let's kill him. Can you imagine that? Let's take William out back. Let's stone him. You know, let, let's just get rid of him. This is what David was going through. Every, the, the, the whole city had just been plummeted, and everybody was uh, just kidnapped, and the men were standing around saying, David, where's my wife? It's all your fault. David said, uh, he was discouraged. He was at the lowest point in his life. Look at this. In 1 Samuel 30, verse 6, New King James Version. Now, David was greatly distressed. Now, David was greatly depressed. David was greatly uh, uh, just totally out of his mind at this point. For the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man from his sons and daughters. But David, come on, somebody look at this. But David strengthened himself in the Lord. He reignited himself in the Lord. When I say it's time to reignite yourself, I'm talking about maybe the pastor doesn't answer his phone and, and maybe your best friend that you were hoping and relying on isn't around and maybe that evangelistical team had to cancel. I don't know what you were relying on, but if you'll take time to rely on God and encourage yourself in the Lord, my God, he will do some things with inside of you. It's time to reignite yourself. In the things of God. If that means getting down on your knees in your bedroom and saying, God, I don't know what's gone wrong with me. I don't know why I made those choices. And I don't know why I made those decisions. But I know that when everybody else forsakes me and the whole city don't want to talk to me, all their conversations have to do is killing me and no one's around to help me. I know that you never leave me and you never forsake me. God, reignite me. Do something within me. Because I can't go on like this. I can't feel like this every day. I can't be the out outcast in my life anymore. I know that all I need is you. Corey Ten Boone once said this, when you have, all you have is Jesus, you realize that all you need is Jesus. It's all about Him. To reignite means this, to catch fire again, again. Out of the natural sense, all you Boy Scouts out there, Girl Scouts, you know, whatever you called yourself, uh, you know, back then, and, and, and you learned to start, I'm not talking about that type of fire, I'm talking about to catch a fire again. I'm talking about when you knelt at an altar or you met in an evangelistical service or you don't know where you were, but you prayed to God and you said, God, take my life and make something out of it. Let your Holy Spirit and fill me, God. I need the power that surge with inside of me. Y'all remember that day? Do you remember that time? I don't know where you at or what age you were, but there's something begin to happen. Do you remember the time that you were lit on fire for God? I'm talking about reigniting. Even if your life hasn't gone astray, and even if you haven't made all these terrible wrong decisions, even as a Christian that's been serving for 20, 30 years, I don't know how long you've been at this thing, but sometimes you got to poke the fire, and sometimes you got to add some wood, and sometimes you got to do something to get it roaring again, or your Christianity will become so mundane. It's not as exciting as it used to be. You just going through the motions of having a relationship with Christ. And he says, I need you to reignite yourself. I want to tell you today that we are going to poke the fire. Come on, somebody. We're going we're gonna to ignite some things within you again this morning. And I don't care how long you've been a Christian. And I don't care if it's been a year or it's been 20 years or 30 years. or I don't care how long it's been. My God, somebody needs to reignite, reignite some things in your life. Amen. Before we start really getting into reigniting, we really first have to talk about burnout. 
How many have ever been burned out? You've been burned. I've been burned out. I've been burned. I've been in ministry pretty much all my life. Uh, my parents were, you know, children's directors, and so I started out in the children's department doing puppets. And, you know, my family was church. That's what we were. We were, we were church family. And so when you're church family, you're, you're involved in the church. So I did puppets. I had Kermit the Frog and Fozzie the Bear. You know, that's, that was mine. That was my thing. And I did it the best. And when after that, it was youth ministry, you know, for 18 some odd years. And, and then after that, it was an associate pastor and, you know, for 10 years or something like that. And it was just, you know, ministry was constantly before me. And there was times that I got to a place of burnout because I just was going through the motions and I was just doing the job. You ever been there? Just doing the job? Just, okay, God, whatever, you know, I'll do it. And then your heart's not really in it anymore, and you're just kind of just making sure that you're filling the position. We do that with our relationship with Christ. You're just filling the position. You're just, yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, that's what they call me. Yeah, I'm a Christian. And we have burnout that comes into our life. What is burnout? It's a physical or mental collapse caused by being overwhelmed or stressed out. You know, if I get stressed out, I get major migraines. That's, that's how it affects me. In fact, uh, last th this past Thursday, I came up here uh, to do, do uh, some work, actually, to work on the message. And when I got here, I sat down and began to work, and this headache just started coming over me. It was one of those ones behind your eyes. You ever have one of those that's behind your eyes, and you feel like your eyes are just going to go, you know, because it hurts so bad? And I just, I stayed here as long as I could, which really, really only an hour. And I, I text Melissa, I said, I'm just letting you know, I'm going home. I, I got to lay down. I got to try to get rid of this thing. I, I, you can't function. You can't function. That's how stress and burnout is. You just can't function. And you don't want to function. And you just want to sit in your depression. And you just want to sit in your distress and say, God, just make it all go away. But God says, I think it's about time we reignite some stuff. Find a new perspective in things. And, and that's what I had to do in my past and in times in ministry. I had to look at it from a new perspective. And a lot of times what would happen is I'd go to some kind of conference, some kind of youth conference or something like that, and it would reignite me. Why? Why is it? Because I saw how somebody else was doing it. And I noticed what I was doing wasn't having results, so I needed to find someone that was getting results. Isn't that much like your walk with Christ? If you're just doing it one way, and you feel like you're not satisfying God, and you feel like you're not doing anything right, and you just feel like you're not on fire anymore, something happens when you get around a Christian that is on fire. And you start seeing the walk with Christ in a different perspective. I've been looking at it all wrong. I've been looking at it like this for so long, but it's strange how when I just tilt the perspective, I see something brand new, and that I realize, oh my gosh, there's so much more to this Christian life. It's not just what I've been doing, but there's so much I've been missing out on to do. And I stop seeing it as it's just about me. And I start seeing that God has me in a position to affect others. Perspective. We see a difference. We see a change. Burnout is a physical mental collapse where you're stressed out and you're overworked. In fact, the Bible talks about burnout. It's written in the book of Matthew. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 talks about burnout. If you don't know this, it says, Then Jesus says, Come to me, all of you who are weary. And carry heavy burdens. And I will give you rest. Isn't, isn't that what burnout needs? Don't you need rest? Because, Belinda, what I found out was uh, Thursday, I hadn't had a day off yet. I was working Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, I was working the weekend. We were up here on Saturday. We were doing all this stuff. I hadn't just got home just to sit down and do nothing. And we need that once in a while. 
We need to just spend time with our family. We need to just, just huddle around on the couch with our kids and our wife and just, just, just watch TV or watch a movie or just have no responsibilities whatsoever. Just chill out. Me and my wife tried that once. We ended up talking about church. We ended up talking about um, uh, conferences. We started, ended up talking. It's like, no, shut up. No church. No. I don't even want to talk about church's chicken. Mm. And so it's just, let's just chill. Let's just chill. But Jesus says, come to me. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Y'all know what a yoke is, right? Right back in those days, they had these oxen. And, and they put this yoke across them, and it would cover two of them, and so they would go in the same direction. And a, and a yoke was heavy. It was, it was solid wood, and it was just pressing down. Jesus said, take my yoke. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Amen. In fact, if you missed it, our theme scripture even talks about the cause of burnout and how to avoid it. Did you catch it? It says this, Romans 12, 2, our theme scripture. Take your everyday, ordinary, you're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, you're walking around life. Doesn't that create burnout? Your everyday life. But it shows you right here at the end how to deal with it. Place it before God as an offer. You've got to give your day to God. You've got to give your everyday, ordinary life to God. Because if you don't, you'll slip up, you'll screw up, you'll mess up, you'll be uh, taken in wrong directions, you'll be involved with people and things you shouldn't, because we just forgot to give our day to God. How simple is that? God, lead me and direct me and guide me today. Help me not make wrong decisions and wrong choices. Lord, put people in my path that only benefit the kingdom of God and benefit my life. And those that don't, put a red flag up, Lord, and show me this is not the direction or the person I need to be with. Amen? How hard is that? How difficult is that? Amen? Put it as an offering before the Lord. In biblical times, an offering was normally placed on an altar. Okay, It was an altar, which was then, of course, set on fire as a sacrifice or an offering to God. Now, when preaching on a message about reigniting, we automatically think about what? Not jazz hands, fire. We think about fire, okay, when we talk about reigniting. In order to start a fire, you have to have three main elements to start a fire. Amen? The first one is this. Look at this. You have to have first, if you look at the screen there, three main elements to reignite. You've got to first have fuel to burn. You've got to have a source of heat. And you have, have to have oxygen to sustain it. That's the only way you're going to make a fire. Just the same as a natural fire is the same in a spiritual reignition. You have to have fuel. You have to have something to burn. You have to have a sacrifice. Number two, you have to have a source of heat. You've got to have something to bring uh, to the table to create the ignition, and that's your faith. You've got to have faith. Oxygen to sustain it. In order to have oxygen to create a fire, to have reignition within your spiritual life, you've got to have oxygen. That's the breath of God. You've got to have these three things. You've got to have a sacrifice. You've got to have faith, and you've got to have the breath of of God upon it. I want to talk to you this morning about the process by which you reignite yourself through a few different people in the Bible here this morning. And the message, allow me to reignite myself. Number one, in order to reignite yourself, you have to find what's going on in your life and remove it. Notice we're using all these re's throughout this series. Re this and re that. You've got to remove it. And I say remove it because you've probably moved it before. You've been to an altar. You laid it down. Been there? You laid it down. But here's what I find a lot of times when people come up for something and, and they maybe they come up for an addiction. 
they come up for an addiction. You know, you have an altar call and you say, all right, the Spirit of God is moving. You got to put a real God in there. You got the Spirit of God is moving in this place. And, and so those that are with addictions, bring your addictions to the altar and lay them down and God will do something with them. And, and what you do, instead of laying all your addictions down, you just want to leave the one that you're okay with everybody knowing about. So you still leave with the addictions. You just laid down, oh, I I smoke. You left it there. And you go, but you still got alcohol. You still got lust. You still got all these different things going on in your life. Why didn't we lay down all the addictions? Because we only want people to know about certain ones. And and then later on, it it seems like once once the the people leave, you sneak back in the sanctuary and pick up the one you laid down. Nobody's looking. (laughs) You sneak it out the sanctuary. That's just a way of saying that you just pick it up when you leave the doors. We just need to lay it down. Remove it because you need to bring something to burn. You've got to bring something to burn. Look at this in Luke twenty two thirty one. 31. It's talking about Peter. Peter was an odd character in the Bible. He was real close to Jesus, and, but he, he was up and down. That's why I love Peter. I love David. There, there's people in the Bible that I just love to preach about because they are so us. Amen? They are so us. Peter was like... A genius one moment, and then totally stupid, ignorant the next. You know, because God was, Jesus was even like, oh, Peter, I could build my church on this revelation. The next minute, he's like, get thee behind me, Satan. And, you know, Peter's like, do you love me? Do you hate me? I don't know what you want. And that's so us. David was the same way. And so here's, uh, here's Jesus and Peter sitting one day. And Jesus looks at him, because Peter's name was first Simon, and he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. And I find it interesting how Jesus told Peter, Satan asked to sift each one of you like wheat, but I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon. Jesus saw something in Peter. He saw something in him, leadership qualities, something that he knew that he needed to pray for him for some reason. Maybe he was easier to fall. Maybe he was uh, stronger than the other. I don't know, but there was something that pointed Peter out that Jesus said, I'm going to pray for you specifically that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, remove it, put it back. Remove it, put it back. It says, when you have returned to me again, strengthen your brothers. And Peter said, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison with you, even die with you. And Jesus said, Peter, let me tell you something. That's what, uh, let me, Peter, come on, come on, come on. This is me. This is Jesus. Come on. Creator of the universe, omnipotent. You know, I know, I know everything. You're saying, I'll go to jail with you. Let me tell you the truth, Peter. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times that you even know me. He said, come on, I'd never do that. I'd go to jail with you. Lord, I'd, I'd die with you. Peter, before the rooster crows, you got a choice to make. See, I've already prophesied this is happening. There was really, I don't think Peter could have changed this because it was just so hardened within him that he was, this was going to happen. But Jesus said, when you return to me, see, it's going to happen. You're going to deny me. And, and, and you're going to feel frustrated inside, and you're going to feel distressed, and you're going to hate what you did, and it's going to happen. But I'm here to tell you that when you get over it, and, and when you return to me, I need you to do something for me, Peter. I've been praying that your strength becomes strong, and I, I've been praying that you'll be able to do this because I need you. When you get over yourself, 
and get back to where I, because we've all done it and we've all been there. Even myself, we get to the place where, oh, I don't need anybody else. And oh, I'm just all about me and I'm this and I, when you get over yourself and come back to me, come back to your senses, I need you to go strengthen your brothers. And I'm praying that your faith doesn't fail because I need you here to do this. See, if we would just get over ourselves during the week, because, Joe, we're all super spiritual here. You know, oh, yeah, yeah, we call down heaven here. You know, we could, we could make the fish multiply here. But something happens with inside of us when we get outside these doors. All of a sudden, it's all about us. And what we want to do, who we want to hang out with, and, and the things we want to put into our lives. And Jesus says, I know Sunday's coming and you're going to return to me. See, there's some that aren't going to return. There's some that are going to feel really good in the service and they're going to be ignited and they're going to be pumped up, but something throughout the week's going to hurt them. And they're not going to show up next Sunday. But Peter, I need you to show up. And I need you to see who's not here. And I need you to get in contact with them. And I need you to encourage your brothers to let them know we missed you. I encouraged some people this past week. I noticed they hadn't been here in a while. So I threw out about three or four different texts because I missed some people. It's not just doing my job. It's doing my heart. Mm, Come on, somebody. Because I truly miss them. See, I'm not here to build this church. We're all here to build this church. We all should be talking to people and saying, hey, you going somewhere? I'm going somewhere. Want to come with me somewhere? Don't say it like that. That sounds a little weird, strange. But (laughs) especially if you're a man talking to a woman or something, I got some candy. No, don't say that. Don't say that. But we invite them. We show interest in their life. Amen? He said, and I know it's going to happen, Peter. I know you're going to screw up, and I know you're going to deny me, and I know it, I know it, I know it. And Peter's denying. He says, no, no, Peter, I know it. I've already seen it. But when you get over yourself, come back. Remove it. Strengthen your brothers. I wrote this down. How can we, the church, expect fire from heaven when we have left nothing on the altar to burn. Huh. You ever pray for that? God send your fire. What did you lay down? Did you lay anything down? Fire only comes, Joel, with a sacrifice. The only reason to set it on fire is because you laid something down to burn. How do you expect the fire of God to fall in the worship team? How do you expect the fire to fall in the message? And how do you expect the fire to fall within the service, within the congregation, if you never laid anything down? There's nothing to burn. This is where we lay our addictions. and This is where we lay our hurt. And this is where we lay our distress and everything that the enemy is trying to put on us. This is where you lay it down to burn. Your everyday, ordinary life. An offering before God. Proverbs 10, 28 says this, The hope of those who are right with God is joy. But the hope of the sinful comes to nothing because they didn't lay anything down. You have joy because you laid it down. You have joy and hope in what God is going to do in your life because you seriously are taking this thing to another level and you're laying something down to burn. Amen? In order to reignite yourself, not only do you need to make sure that you're removing something, but you need to take time to relight it. Relight it. Relight in your life what has been going down. Faith is the source to reignite the sacrifice. It's faith. It's faith. The Bible even says faith pleases God. It's faith. 
Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. It's not always that something's in front of you, but you're believing that it's coming sooner or later. It's faith to know that Christ is coming back for us. How many had a grandma years ago that you as a kid, she was saying, Jesus is coming back soon. And grandma's dead and gone. And you're a grown adult. And so now you're telling your kids, Jesus Christ is coming soon. We don't know when he's coming, but I have hope and I have faith. And I can understand how this generation might look at you and think, how stupid is that? Why don't you just say the mothership is coming and, you know, the, and we're all going to be sucked up to the planet Zortan and, or, you know, something like that. You know, no, I, I don't, I'm not talking about that kind of junk. And, and I find it strange that the world doesn't believe that a man died on a cross for us and shed his blood. But you have people that are in Scientology that believe that there's spaceships and people on Mars and, and, and all these different things about uh, how you, when you die, your soul goes to another planet. How do you think about that? stuff, but you can't admit that there's a God that loves you enough that died on a cross for you, shed his blood, and says, someday I'm coming back for you. But until that day, I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. I love you. That's the hope. That's the hope. Don't give me some stupid story. Give me the truth. I have faith. I have faith. There's a man by the name of Elijah. He was a prophet. God told him, he said, go and tell the king that it's not going to rain for three years. That's it, just three years. Judgment. Three years. Well, without rain, no crops, no animals. You know, it is just total devastation. So after three years, Elijah's back on the scene, and God says, go and tell the king it's going to rain. And so within this, it's like, okay, I'm just going to tell this guy it's going to rain. And all of a sudden, we turn into this big contest. I think it's awesome. Elijah goes in there, and he's just, it's like, okay, God, I'm going to go in there. I'm going to tell the king what's up. But at the same time, man, I just got to prove how awesome you are. Let's have a contest at Mount Carmel. Let's, let's have a, a contest that shows that you're the true God. Because there was 150 prophets of Baal that were hanging around, and they really only served Baal because uh, of, of the king and queen, and they told them who to worship based on what they needed. That's how it was, Belinda. It was based on what they needed. Whatever God they needed, that's who they worshiped. And so Baal was considered the sky god. We hear about like a lot of that in Egyptian teaching that talks about Ra and all that, the same thing, Baal, the sky god, the sun god. And so they needed to pray. God in order to get rain. Well, Elijah's coming in there and saying, y'all, y'all are jacked up, man, because, you know, God, Jehovah, he created all this. Why you got to go to a tree God and a sky God and a frog God and all these different gods, a fish God? And, I mean, they worshiped anything. Just go to God, the one that spoke it, and it happened. And I think it's, it's awesome that they pray to the very one that if he's a sky god, of course, the sun god, of course, there, there's going to be fire. I mean, that's consistent with that. Amen? It's like they it, truly, he should be able to, Frank, he should be able to produce fire. Ah, oh, fire! You know? But it says they went for hours worshiping Baal and at an altar, and nothing happened. And Elijah steps in. He says, y'all get out the way. I love the message version. He, he, talks, he starts to taunt them and say, where's your God? He on vacation? The message version said, is he on the toilet? I love it. Oh, that, that is such, you know, writing. But, you know, anyway, <laughs> poetry in motion. <laughs> in motion. Anyway, so, you know, it's... He <laughs> and so he's like, y'all get out the way. And look at this in 1 Kings 18, 36 through 39, the New Living Translation. It says, at the usual time for offering, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed. See, because before this, he said, y'all come here. Come here. Come on. Come on. I've been sitting here all day watching y'all shenanigans. 
and you know, I can't get, I, I don't have time to get into the prophets that cut themselves and how that ties into worldly music and the slashing and the, all that. I can't get into that right now. Y'all going to have to wait to a lyrical lie something, you know, that we do that. But anyway, Elijah says, y'all come here. Let me show y'all something. And he begins to pray. He says, oh, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, who there it is again, Jacob talked about that last week, how it doesn't say Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, but God just says, still says Jacob because he knows that you've got issues and you, he knows you've got problems, but he's still your God. Woo, come on, somebody. He says, prove it today. He tells God, prove it today that you are the God in Israel. Can I tell somebody that we're here today to reignite some people and I have been praying, God, prove it today. That you are the God of the EWC, that you are the God of Corpus Christi, that you are the God of every single person in here. And those that say, yes, Lord, you will ignite them today. God, prove it. Prove it. He said, prove it. Not only that you're God, but I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command. Not because we thought it was a great idea to do this series, but because God commanded of it. I like when God puts something in my spirit, and then later on I have people tell me, oh, I've been going through that, or you have really helped me through this series because this is right where I'm at, or this or that. That tells me that I heard from God. I heard from God. That's not just some cute idea. Oh, we'll just find something with a suit on it, stick a lion's head on it, and we'll just go with you know, the best series will be worshipology. No, 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 no. We need this. We need this. We need to reignite ourselves, especially if you're going through something right now. Because the thing that the enemy wants to do the most, most is weaken you. How can you defeat what's trying to come against you when you're at your weakest point? God says, I need to strengthen you. Because when you're weak, he is hmm, strong. And the only way you're going to get strength is through him. Because if it wasn't for him, you'd be at home right now, sitting in the corner, worrying about everything. You'd be on your bed crying. You'll be in a fetal position because you don't know. You'd be thinking about suicidal thoughts. You'd have depression all over. If it wasn't for him. Hmm. He says, prove it. Answer me. So these people will know that you, O oh God, you, O oh Lord, are God, and that you have brought them back to yourself. Does that sound familiar? Peter, when you've gotten over yourself, come back to me. God, show them that you are who you are and have brought them back to yourself. Reignite them. Re reignite them. Look at this. Somebody say immediately. Ooh, somebody say it again. Say immediately. The fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven. Not Baal, not the sun god, but the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, the dust. It even licked up the water in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their face down on the ground and cried out, The Lord, He is God. Yes, the Lord is God. Notice the fire burned up everything. Not just what you laid down. Catch this. Catch this, Joel. I love this. Not just what he laid down, but what surrounded it and supported it. Because the things in the world, the, the wrong friends, the wrong company, the wrong everything, will help support the thing you're trying to lay down the most by holding it back up. Saying you don't need to lay that down. You don't need to get rid of that. And they support it. And they say, oh, but isn't your life greater just by living for the world? And isn't your life greater being with this person? And isn't your life greater? You've wanted a relationship so long, and you haven't had a relationship in so long. So isn't even if you're settling for less, isn't this better? 
and they support it and it surrounds it. But when God sent the fire, it licked it all up. It took it all away. Now there was nothing supporting your issue anymore, your addiction anymore, your problems or things that you're going through in life. Nothing is there to hold it up anymore. Now it's been taken up. And it said it even licked up the dust. See, sometimes when we lay things down, there's still the remnants. There's still the remnants. There's still the dust. There's still the stuff. Maybe it's your house. You laid it down at the church, but there's still some things at your house. You laid it down at the church, but there's still some people at your work. And you laid it down at the church, but there's still some things in your family. God says, I licked it all up. I took it all up. I took it all away. What I need you to do is I need you to stand strong in what I've already done. I'll remove it. If you'll relight it and lay it down, I'll take it up. Amen? Look at this. The absence of faith is like leaving rotting meat on an altar drenched with doubt. Hmm. That's like Laying something down, but having no faith whatsoever that God's going to do anything with it. It's just like rotting meat. It festers, and it attracts things, and it, it stinks, and, and it's just it's part of your life now because there's no faith there to say, remove it. You never relit it. How many have ever tried to light a fire that's been drenched with water? You can't do it. That, that, that's, that's Cub Scouts 101. You, you don't light a wet fire. How, how can you light your sacrifice if it's been drenched in doubt? You can't do it. Faith is the evidence. It, it, it's, you're putting it out there. It's saying, God, I don't know when you're going to do it. I don't know if you're going to pull an Elijah on me and immediately take it away. I don't know if it's going to be a process. But God, I've got the faith to know that I am laying it down. I am relighting that sacrifice, God. And I'm expecting you to do something with it. I have faith. I have faith. Mark eleven twenty two says this. And Jesus said to the disciples, have faith in God. I tell you the truth, you can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. But you must really believe it'll happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything, and if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. See, see we, we believe it only when we see it. Huh. Believe it when you see it. Remember Jacob? Y'all here last Sunday? If you weren't, go back and watch the message and, and repent for not being here. Anyway, so, you know, <laughs> Jacob had a dream. If you weren't here, Jacob had a dream. He laid his head on a, a stone on a rock, and uh, he, he began to have this vision, this dream of angels ascending and descending and all these different things. And Jesus is standing at the top of the ladder, and he says, I will be your God, and I will supply for you, and I will lead you where you need to be. And Jacob says, if he does this, then I'll worship him. And if he does this, I'll call him God. And if he does this, I'll give to him. It's not about when you see it. It says you can pray for anything, and if you believe that you've received it, if you believe that you've received it, it's not about that it's in your hands already. You just believe that you've received it. It's like when, when somebody prays over you and says, man, God is sending you a blessing. I receive it. Did you see it yet? I receive it, though. For when God's ready to give it to me, my hands are already in the position. My heart is already open. But I'm already believing the wheels are in motion to do something about it. And it's on its way. Hmm. Believe that you've received it. And it'll be yours. I, I order a lot of stuff from Amazon. A lot of stuff on Amazon. And when I order, I push you know, whatever that button is. <laughs> I can't remember what it is, but you know, place your order. 
And it, it says, <laughs> sorry, I had a brain fart there. Anyway, so, you know, you push that button, and it says, your order is now being processed. In my mind, it's already mine. It's mine. Y'all seen that thing on Facebook of that lady sitting by the mailbox? And she's like waiting for FedEx. She's, wait, she's smoking a cigarette. But, you know, she's like this. She's waiting. And she'll even get up. Nobody walked by. she even get up and look in her mailbox and she'll sit back down. That's how I am, Joel. I've already received it in here. I don't have it here. I haven't put it on the wall. I haven't plugged it in yet. I haven't put it on the stage. But I already receive it. And I am waiting with expectation for that, uh, that heavenly brown truck to drive in front of my house. And, and I'm waiting for that path. My God, why don't we get more excited? Blessings of God. If God said it, it'll happen. Why don't you start getting in the position of saying, I receive it. Woo, I receive it. I don't see it yet, but I receive it. Well, God's healing your marriage. I don't see it yet, but I receive it. God is healing your finances. I don't see it yet, but I receive it. My God, your, God is turning your children and your teenagers into godly men and women. I don't see it, but I receive it. I receive it. It will be yours. Hmm. Last one. Is this helping anybody? Mm, it's helping me. My God. I'm a, oh, sh- I've only been pastoring for a year, a year now. And look, I'm already seeing a new perspective. I'm already seeing a new perspective. I will not get burnout. I hear about pastors all the time. Oh, I've been pastoring for 30 years. I'm burnt. No, no, no. I'm just going to keep turning. I'm just going to keep seeing new perspective. I'm just going to see new. Th- oh, come on. Somebody going to go with me? You're going to go with me? Come on. Yeah. Woo! Last one, last one. You got to help me. This is kind of interactive right here. Everybody just take a deep breath. Oh, you got to re-breathe it. Re-breathe it. Re-breathe it. Some of us haven't felt the breath of God in a long time. You got to re-breathe it. Re-breathe it. Take another breath for the first time. Take another breath for the first time. Breathe in. Breathe in. God is on your life. It's time that you take it in. See, when God created Adam, it said that Adam was there. He created him in the the dust, and he breathed in him. No other human had been created yet. No other human had been brought to life yet. But Adam was the first one. And it's amazing to me that because of the breath that was put in that man, and when he had kids, the breath was transferred and transferred, and then the breath has never stopped. We're all still breathing. The breath of God will always sustain the fire of God in your life. There was a man by the name of Ezekiel, and Ezekiel was a prophet, and one day God took him into a vision, and in this vision, he takes him into this valley, and this very disturbing view that Ezekiel had as he looked over the valley, all he saw was dismembered bones, thigh bones, leg bones, toes over here, fingers over here, skulls over here, just thousands Upon thousands, I mean, it just, it just looked like a war zone that had happened years ago of decay and torture. And God says, Ezekiel, can these bones live again? What do you think, buddy? Can, can, you know, can they live again? He says, well, only you know the answer to that, Lord. He says, speak to the bones. Speak to the bones. Prophesy to the bones. And it says that as he began to speak over them, there was a, just a rattling. So rattling within the valley, just rattling. 
just rattling. Just the sound just began to echo and earthquake through the valley. And all of a sudden, bones began to snap back into place. And you know the song, the head bones connected to the, you know, all this began to happen. And snapping back and legs back in play. All of a sudden, these skeletons. As he continued to prophesy, it says the muscle began to grow. I mean, can you imagine the sight that Ezekiel was seeing as muscle and tendons and veins begin to grow over the bones and all these bodies just laying there and flesh began to form and all these different things. And he says, oh my gosh, Lord, look! And I believe it's a picture of the church. Because Ezekiel said there's no breath. It's time that the church breathe again. There's nothing throughout the valley. Silence. And he says this. He says, Ezekiel, speak a prophetic message to the winds, son of man. Speak a prophetic message and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, O oh, breathe from the four winds. Breathe into these dead bodies so that they may live again. Here we go again. Peter, when you've gotten over yourself, come back to me again. Elijah, standing before the altar. God. Bring these people back to you again. Ezekiel, breathe life into these bodies so they might live again. Reignition. In all three of these stories, reignition. Peter, reignite your brothers. Elijah, reignite the people. Ezekiel. We're going to reignite an army. We're going to do something. Speak to the wind. And so I spoke the message as he commanded me. And breath. Hmm. Breath came into the bodies. See, all across the valley, all these thousands of bones that are connected back into people, it wasn't a sound, Joel, of... It was a sound of <gasps> intake, inhale. But in order to inhale, there has to be something to inhale. I believe at that moment when he spoke to the winds and the winds began to move from the four corners of the earth, I believe God himself was going. <sighs> and then in unison, the bodies. And it says that they rose to their feet, came back to life, stood up on their feet, and became a great army. How is this possible? Because oxygen sustains the fire. Oxygen, the breath of God, will reignite what needs to be put aflame in your life. And I can guarantee you, every day, God is, William, God is, Isaiah, Jesse, God is blowing. But you know what we got a lot of Christians doing? <laughs> Inhale. Mm-mm. Mm-mm-mm. Maybe on Sunday. If I feel good enough, maybe on Wednesday, but I seriously doubt it. Mm -mm. We got a lot of blue Christians out there. They're holding their breath like a little kid because they ain't getting what they want. I want the things of the world. I want to live like I want to live. And God's saying... God's saying, would you just, uh, and when you
when you take it in, you on somebody else. And all of a sudden, God is moving, moving and doing something. And we become a great army. Show me a man inhaling the ways of the world, and I will show you a man gasping for the breath of God. Hmm.